So, uh, good morning and welcome learners. That uh, in our today's lesson, we are going to start a new chapter all together. And the chapter is going to be animals. Now, when I mention animals, I know you have dealt with animals in our previous classes. In class 6, you dealt with animals. And in class 6, class 6, class 6 animals, you dealt with uh, animal feeds. In animal feeds, you talked about the preserved, preserved feeds. These are the ones that are kept for future use. And you talked about pasture, sorry, you talked about hay, and then silage. Where we say this one is dried, dried and put into bells before storing. While silage, silage is stored while green stored while green in things we call silos and before just before discovered it is pressed and we said the importance of pressing this is to remove the air the air inside if you, you, put, you place the the, the, the the cover that is a, a polythene paper without pressing to remove the air that can cause rotting why is it going to cause rotting Lana I want you to understand that if we're going to place inside this, this air inside, remember part of that air is oxygen. So oxygen uh, supports bacterial uh, growth inside there. So they are going to bring about, about uh, uh, rotting. Then we talked about, uh, these are preserved feeds. You also talked about commercial feeds. Commercial feeds, we say these are feeds that are bought from the market. And most of the time, these feeds are in powder form. In powder form. Meaning that they lack two things. We say they lack two things. They lack water and they lack, they lack, a, and they lack fiber. Why are they lacking fiber? Because they are ground into water, into, 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 into uh, some powder. And also, they lack water because they are dried. Before. You cannot grind, grind something that is, that is, that is wet. You wait. If maize, you want to grind some maize, you wait for it to dry so you can be able to grind and get some, some, uh, some flour. So they lack fiber and water. This is a question in the exam. Talking about the commercial fees also, we say they are different. They are those ones that pro provide proteins in the animal. They are those that provide uh, vitamins. They are those that provide fats. And they are those that provide minerals. All these are commercial feeds. In, in class six, then of course uh, we call them. The other name is concentrates. Call them concentrates. They are prepared in the markets, and their main function, the main functions of these uh, concentrates is number one. We say the function number one is to increase, increase productivity. Productivity. What are we talking about? Whenever we are keeping animals, either cows or even goats or even, uh, hens, we are either keeping them for hens, uh, for eggs, sorry. We are keeping them for meat. We are keeping them for milk. So whenever we are giving concentrates, we want the animals to produce more of this. So that is number one. To increase productivity. So that every day they are not just feeding on grass. So we bring the already ground and mix the uh, uh, commercial feeds to come and give them. Number two, we say the other function of, uh, the other importance of concentrates is to supplement, supplement fodder, fodder and pasture. Fodder and pasture. What's the difference between fodder and pasture? Fodder, we say, is, is prepared there, then brought, cut and brought the animal like the animals in a zero grazing. The animals in zero grazing. You must start and bring them to the animals. But first, you take the animals there. You take the animals to go on to the grazing field and they take the animals from there themselves. So that is the only difference. So that's all about um, classic work that you did about animals. And then uh, these uh, feeds, you also talked about methods of grazing. 
I want to remind you so that when you are in class 7, you understand what we are doing. The methods of grazing, we yes, said there are only three main methods of grazing. Three main methods of grazing. Number one, stational grazing. Stational grazing. Number two, we are padding. The method. And number three, we have uh, uh, stational grazing, padding, and stall feeding. Stall feeding is also known as uh, zero grazing. Zero grazing, why? There's zero movement. Animals do not move. They are enclosed in a, in a stall. Hence the word stall feeding. Enclosed in a house where the house is divided, divided into, into stalls. So the animals are brought, are brought uh, the food there. They put in a, in a feed trough. Or the water. The water is also put in a, in a water trough. So there's no movement of the animals. But here, these are the three main methods. But again, in rotational grazing, what is this rotational grazing you are talking about here? Rotational grazing means that animals are moving from one end, okay, from one particular place to another one, but in a controlled uh, way, I mean a uh, method. And so we have three ways of rotational grazing, the way we can be able to, uh, to respond animals. I'm going to illustrate that using using uh, uh, some diagrams here. So we have what we call paddocking. So paddocking is a way of is a way of uh, you know, grazing where animals animals land or uh, or uh, grazing land is divided into 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 plots. The plots are called paddocks. These are paddocks. And so each paddock has a gate. There is water. So animals are brought to to eat from this end. So once grass is finished here, they move to the next paddock through this gate. And this one is closed completely. So animals cannot come back to this. So they continue eating from this one and there's water also. What what taps are there? So once they finish the, the grass from this side, it's open here and animals get back to this. And this one is closed. So there's a movement from that side going to that direction. So from here they move to this next. So before coming to paddock A, grass will have regrowed. So they will find some grass here to feed on. And so the animals keep rotating on that particular piece of land. It's a big piece of land which has been divided into paddocks, small portions, where animals eat in a controlled manner. Now what are the features of this particular uh, uh, grazing method? Number one, there is permanent fences. When you talk about permanent fences, meaning that animals cannot cannot get out of that land. So what happens? The outside fence, which demarcates land, and also the, 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 the fences that are used to to, 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 to to make portions are also permanent, meaning that they cannot be moved from there and taken to another place. So that is what we call the, the difference between um, paddocking and the next one which is uh, strip grazing. Now in strip grazing, I want you to see what I'm doing here. The, in, the, the, the inner fence is not permanent. That's why I'm putting dots, meaning that it's temporary. So there's temporary fences, temporary fences, but the outside fence is permanent, permanent fence. So the inside fence is a kind of um, a little electric fence where you just come and place and most feed on that particular Area, and you remove it, the all of it, take to another place where there's grass. So it's always it's always permanent or temporary. So the animals the same way, they go rotating like that. The ends, that's the reason we call it rational grazing. So rational grazing methods are one, paddocking, number two, strip grazing, and the third one is the one that is so popular, and this one looks like this. You have a peg. You make a peg using a stick and then you come and tie an animal there. You tie your goat there. So these goats uh, just eat the, 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 the radius of that particular rope. It eats the radius of that particular rope. So once it, it clears grass from this end, you move the peg and take it to another place. You, you peg it down there and send it just eat 
the radius of that rock. You remove it there, take to another place with, with grass. And that's why we call it a method of rotational grazing. So we call this, we call it tethering. Tethering. You can decide also to, 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 to tie this animal onto a, a, an already grown uh, tree, which is alive. Or you can make use of uh, pets. So those are the traditional grazing methods. There are three, strip, paddocking, and tethering. But the main traditional grazing methods are three, rotational, adding, and then the last one I talked about, uh, which was stall feeding. All those are methods of uh, grazing. Now I want us to move from that and move to something different. Now in today's lesson, I was just introducing this particular lesson so that basically you know what we are talking about when we talk about animals. Now in this case, we are going to talk about the animal parasites. The animal parasites. And what are parasites? These are organisms that fully depend on another animal for its survival. So we can say a parasite, a parasite is an organism, an organism that fully depends, fully depends on another for its survival. I want to give an example on that. A parasite is an organism that fully depends on another one for survival. And in this case, I'll give you an example of a, a cow and a tick. A cow, and then you have a tick. Now, if you can, you can be able to notice in our, in our definition we are saying, depends on another organism for survival. So which one depends on the other for survival? Of course, this one. So in this case, our parasite is, is the, the tick. It depends on the cow for survival by taking blood from it. So it sucks blood from it. And so, the cow now is not a parasite, but has its own name. The name of this cow is the host. So a parasite depends on the host for survival. So the one that abas that particular parasite is called the host. So a goat is an host. Uh, 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 maybe a camel is, 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 a, is an host. A dog is an host because ticks will find some ticks on, on dogs, and they are, they, are, they are feeding blood from them. So in this case, you must understand the cow is the host, and then the tick is the parasite. Without this host, the parasite will not survive. It will eventually die. And that's why when we, it comes to the ways of controlling pests, we will have one particular method of controlling pests, we call rotational grazing method. And as, as, as we will be there, I will explain why it controls pests. Why it controls pests. So in this case, we are also going to talk about uh, the types of pests that we have. The type of pests. Types of pests. We call them pests or parasites. Animal pests or parasites. And the types of animal pests or parasites. And there are two. There are two. The one we are going to call internal, internal parasites. And then we have number two, external parasites. External parasites. I want to explain. I want to explain this. When we talk about in internal parasites, we talk about those parasites that are found inside the body of the host. In this case, we have known what the host means. Host means the animal that is dependent on by the parasite. So those ones that are found inside the body are known as internal parasites. They are found inside the body of the animal. The example is liver flukes. Liver flukes, they are found inside the pig. We talk about uh, hookworms. Hookworms, ETC. Then we talk about external parasites. These are found on the skin of the animal. Like for example, I just talked about ticks. Whenever you are walking in the cow shed, you can easily notice a, a, a tick on the, on, on, the, on the skin of the animal. So these are found, found on, the, on the body. That is the skin of the animal. 
and you have good examples like talk about ticks, talk about mites, talk about fleas. All these are found on the, on the body of the animal. So we call them external parasites. Internal parasites found in X means outside. External parasites. So get uh, uh, take note of that. So we want to identify areas where these external parasites are found. External parasites. We want to, to, to exactly know where they can be found. Number one, these external uh, parasites can be found on the ears. Ears of the animals. Inside the ears or on top of the ears, you can find them. At the base, at the base of the horns. Horns. The horns of the animals. That's an animal. Maybe a cow, something like that. Or a rabbit. You find at the base, here, where the, where the horns starts to grow from. Where they start to grow from. You find some things there. You can find them on the tail. Talk about the other. And the teeth. Teeth. Where you milk, uh, get your milk from. Talk about uh, under the tail. There is another tail. Under the tail. We also talk about the other eyes. Eyes. Those are, the, are very strong. Eh? Talk about skin and eyes. Eyes are very strong. The ones that can be, not be perforated easily. Like for cows, you get a, you get a hide, but uh, human beings have a skin. So you find them in those areas. We also talk about, talk about ears, and so forth and so on. So those are the areas if you want to locate external parasites. Go looking for them in these areas. You'll definitely find them. So that, that's where they, they are found. And so we can just, you can just see where they, they attack. Now there is a table there that I'm going to look at. The parasites and the animals they attack, the livestock they attack. So I'll give you the page that you're going to look into and draw that table. I will not discuss that. You will, you will do it in your own life. For example, there are parasites like parasites on that side, livestock, livestock. A tick attacks various animals. Talk about cattle, sheep, talk about goats. So that's where they are. Those are the animals attacked by, by tick. Talk about mites. Mites are attacked by attacked, they attack pigs. They also attack horses. They attack sheep. They attack cattle. They attack rabbits. It is sick. Those are the number of animals and many others that are attacked by that. Then flea. Flea attack pigs. They attack poultry. When you talk about poultry, talking about the birds that we domesticate, the ones that we keep at home, talk about hen, chicken, goose, and the like. And rabbits. And rabbits. Then we talk about laws. Laws is one. When they are made, they are called lice. They are found in poultry. They are found in pigs. They are found in sheep. Cattle, finally horses. This is very important because it's a question that comes in the exam. And lastly, we have the sets of flies. Sets of flies. Sets of flies attack all domestic animals. All domestic animals. So sister flies attack all domestic animals. Name them. The, the, the rest, the cows, the girls, sheep, all those are attacked by the flies. So this is a table showing the parasites and the animals attacked by that particular parasite.
So learn in our next lesson, we are going to deal with internal parasites. Internal parasites, and we are going to see where exactly do these internal parasites attack. So remember in our lesson, I've just remind, I reminded you of what we did in class 6 about animals, talked about the animal feeds, we talked about uh, the, the, ways of, the ways of grazing animals, we talked about nutritional grazing, we talked about stall feeding, and we talked about herding. And we said herding is one of the most expensive ways of uh, keeping animals. Not expensive in terms of structures, but expensive in terms of controlling, controlling uh, uh, diseases. You cannot easily control diseases when it comes to, to, to herding, because animals go and mix now with uh, animals from other places. And so you, you find them interacting. And so if the animals who are sick, they will definitely pass the same uh, disease to the other animals, those, those who are healthy. So uh, up to that moment, Lana, we are going to look into uh, internal parasites in the next lesson. So have a blessed night, keep safe and stay at home while you sanitize. Thank you and God bless you.